Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session on the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. Today's lecture is a continuation of the previous lecture and we continue to locate the various socio-political events that served as a background for the Carolyn age or the age of uh, Milton or the period of interregnum that followed. So, let us begin this lecture by looking at the turn of events which led up to the English Civil War. In the previous session, we noted that the fifth and the final meeting that Charles had with the parliament in 1640, it also inaugurated a long and deadly struggle between the monarch and the parliament. And here we go taking a look at a series of events that led to the English Civil War. On 10th November 1640, we find the parliament taking more charge and they also get Stratford, Earl of Stratford who is Charles advisor arrested. He is charged of high treason. Uh, th there was actually no particular reason to arrest uh, him and charge him for high treason. This is only uh, one of the smart ways through which the parliament thought they could uh, curb uh, the powers of, uh, this was only one of the ways through which they thought they could curb the uh, powers of uh, the advisor and also uh, bring in, to, in some form to in, and, and also in some form uh, clip the extensive powers that Charles enjoyed uh, in England then. So, uh, he is charged of high treason and sent to tower and Charles is also forced to sign the death warrant which he does very reluctantly. Initially, he completely refused to sign the death warrant because uh, he thought that it was completely uh, against his conscience and also he was not convinced about what he was going to do. But some political uh, thinkers and historians still later point, they also feel that if Charles had agreed to sign the death warrant of the Earl of uh, Stratford right away, he could have perhaps found a scapegoat and uh, could have perhaps uh, uh, negotiated into a better relation with the parliament. He could have laid the uh, blame of the Scottish rebellion on the Earl of uh, Stratford and could have come out uh, fairly innocent from the entire uh, issue that he had created in uh, Scotland in terms of uh, introducing the uh, religious prayer book, the Anglican prayer book in Scotland. Uh, but however, we do find him uh, being very reluctant to sign it initially, but the parliament threatened uh, to end the lives of the queen and his children and so fearing all of these catastrophe, uh, he signs the death warrant of uh, the Earl of Stratford. And soon after that, the parliament also uh, presents a series of a catalog of complaints against the king Charles I and uh, Charles is in no mood to uh, listen to any of those things. We find him saying uh, uh, an emphatic no to any of the uh, negotiations or any of the proposals that the parliament was putting forward. He continues to assert the divine right of kings and we also find him uh, being uh, quite arrogant even to the point of foolishness in believing in the divine right and also in the uh, in the terms of absolutist monarchy. And in the meantime, the parliament also asked him to uh, impeach the queen because they also thought that the queen was uh, holding a lot of evil influence over Charles. But uh, by then Charles decides that he has had enough and he uh, goes on to take this very drastic step. In, on 3rd Jan 1642, we find Charles ordering the arrest of five members of the parliament including John Pym. But the parliament by then they also was in no mood to take on any kind of a confrontation from uh, the king. They refused to surrender these five members and they all flee London and also particularly John Pym. He had a lot of uh, uh, support from the public during the time that uh, he the king uh, has had completely managed to enrage not just the parliamentarians but also the uh, commoners by then. And also uh, we begin to see that this becomes a uh, perhaps a momentous thing and a fatal thing that Charles did and with this around this time he also loses control over not just the parliament but also the city of London. So, the city of London and the parliament becomes uh, quite loggerheads with Charles and he also sends the queen to Holland for her safety. And during this time, we find John Pym launching a campaign against Charles I. So, he had three things in mind when he launched this campaign. He asked for, uh, he in the sense he as a representative of the parliament, he asked for control over three things, the armed forces, the church and the law. And Charles obvious response was 
no to the parliament. He was in no mood to listen to any of these things or to negotiate with the parliament even to a little bit. Here it's important to reiterate that the parliament even at this point they did not even imagine uh, getting rid of Charles and they did not even imagine get, getting rid of a monarch from uh, the uh, island of England. But all that they had in mind was to introduce a set of principles and a set of uh, uh, to introduce a set of principles that would uh, perhaps bring in a more uh, balance of power in England. And uh, Charles does not uh, mm, seem to get any of these uh, uh, clues and he just uh, marches on right away with uh, Charles does not seem to agree to any of the terms that they uh, put up. And at this point we find that John Pym enlists an army and uh, Charles also enlists another set of army. With this we find the English civil war breaking out. This was initially not something that Charles or the parliament had in mind, but we begin to see that it just uh, led to the eventuality which uh, uh, had to eventually happen. So, on 23rd October 1642, we find the English civil war breaking out in England. And Initially, the royalists had a lot of uh, successes, a series of successes in fact and the, and the parliamentarians were continually getting defeated. We also saw in the previous sections, uh, in the previous session who supported who, who the supporters of the king were and the, who the supporters of the parliament were. So, uh, in that sense, the king already had an army which was well trained. So, the uh, parliament did not have that kind of ability in them. So, they uh, find themselves continually facing uh, failure and lot of difficulties in uh, maintaining a disciplined army as well. It is at this point that we find the entry of Oliver Cromwell. It is at this point that we find the entry of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell uh, was a staunch Puritan. We shall shortly take a look at who he really was and what the kind of influence that he had on England. He managed to create a very disciplined army and within three years we find that his army could outwit the royalist army. So, by 14th June 1645. So, by 14th June 1645 we find Oliver Cromwell's army defeating the royalists. So, this, this does not really mark the end of the civil war. We also find a series of wars uh, happening back and forth with the support of uh, uh, Scotland, Ireland. We find the commonwealth entirely getting dragged into this imbroglio. But uh, nevertheless, we shall not be going to the details of this right away. And by 1647, the inevitable happens. Uh, King Charles is in roundhead custody and he is imprisoned. But even at this point of time, we find him continuing to be the arrogant believer in the divine right of kings. He, he just refuses to negotiate with the parliament. He continues to uh, say no to all kinds of proposals that the parliament was trying to bring in. At this point of time, even one of the king's uh, closest uh, friends, the Duke of Richmond, he thought that the king was being very foolish in refusing to bargain at this point of time. Uh, we find Richmond making this statement. A crown so nearly lost was never so easily recovered as this would have been. So, many of the, even the king's supporters, they uh, begin to realize that king was making a very foolish decision at this point of time, being imprisoned and unwilling to negotiate with the uh, parliamentarians. So, as they move on, Charles continues to be imprisoned and also in between he manages to flee to Scotland, but uh, he is not, uh, does not find much favor over there as well. He is again imprisoned and handed back to the uh, English uh, uh, parliament. So, the parliament also loses uh, patience because they had been trying to deal with this uh, king for about two decades and uh, he is not relenting at all. So, they eventually lose patience and they realize that they have got only two and they realized that they have got only two options in, uh, options with them. One was to agree to Charles terms which obviously they could not because he was not willing to negotiate at all. The second one was to execute Charles. So, we find that the parliament goes ahead with this decision to execute Charles. This was an unprecedented thing in England. The king uh, being executed or even putting a king under trial, nobody knew how to go about the procedures. Nevertheless, the trial is ordered. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, according to the contempt, according to the laws of England, at that point of time, no king could be 
uh, trialed on a court because no court had the kind of authority because no court had the authority over uh, any monarch. Anyway, the trial is ordered and we find the, the trial happening on 1st Jan. We find the trial happening on the New Year Day of 1649. King Charles I is uh, tried and he is also condemned for being the enemy of the Commonwealth. This was for the kind of uh, uh, things that he, that he inflicted on England. Scotland and Ireland put together. We also find that at this point of time, uh, the king continues to be arrogant. He refuses to accept the authority of the court uh, to put him under trial. And he also, though he was uh, quite disheveled by then and he had uh, lost most of uh, almost all of his powers, he continues to be a very composed person during the trial. Nevertheless, he is condemned on 27th Jan 1649. And on 30th Jan 1649, we find that he is executed, he is in fact uh, beheaded and history tells us that he uh, accepted this decision with uh, much composure and he also uh, tried to convince himself that this was the punishment that God was giving him for signing the death warrant of uh, the Earl of Buckingham eight years uh, before. And this was not in fact the beginning of uh, another golden period for uh, England. Uh, this was not the beginning of democracy in England. This was this had only put an end to absolutist monarchy and we also do not see England marching to a better future immediately. Oliver Cromwell comes into the scene at this point of time. He was also the one who engineered the victory of the parliamentarians against the royalists. So at this point of time it becomes very important for us to take a look at who Oliver Cromwell really was and what his role was in shaping English history after the beheading of Charles I. Oliver Cromwell was born in 1599 and lived till 1658 and 1599 we uh, noted multiple times it was an important year in terms of English literary history. It was the year when uh, the Globe Theatre was erected and also the year when uh, Edmund Spencer died. Oliver Cromwell uh, was uh, from a good family. Many historians talk about him as a man of good family. He was uh, uh, fairly wealthy. He was related to important persons in the House of Commons. He was also a gentleman farmer. And uh, he also had very idealistic views about life. He owned a little land which he cultivated, but he never saw land as a means of making livelihood. And it was not a hereditary, uh, for, for him, it was not a hereditary possession or a matter of social and family pride. And that since he was a true gentleman and he refused to succumb to the dominant uh, mercenary ideas which were uh, uh, which were dominating England uh, during those times. And uh, due to a certain turn of events in his own uh, uh, personal life, he also becomes a staunch uh, Puritan. And we find him uh, displaying a strong belief in Puritanism and also, and this was perhaps the thing which helped him to enlist a disciplined army and achieve success against uh, the uh, royalists. And he was not a soldier, but we do find him uh, displaying the skills of uh, a uh, very fine lieutenant and he also rises to power very quickly. He was also one of the signatories of Charles' death warrant in 1649 and then he assumes power as the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland. This was from 1653 to 1649. We also find England falling into confusion after his death and uh, Cromwell continues to be seen as a controversial figure in history. Irrespective of the kind of leadership that he gave to the parliamentarians for their uh, for, for their victory against the uh, against the royalists, uh, one is not too sure whether he is a hero of liberty or uh, whether he is a dictator. Uh, he was uh, condemned and continues to be condemned for his uh, uh, for the genocide that he committed in Ireland and uh, Scotland. And in fact, soon after the beheading of uh, Charles the first, he ensues this. Uh, uh, reckless uh, kind of uh, uh, raids in Scotland and Ireland in order to wipe out the Catholic population and also he, um, he goes a little overboard when he tries to uh, catch hold of any royalists who were remaining even after the end of the civil war. So he did not, does not become a popular figure in England and at the later point of time uh, with the restoration of monarchy in 1660 we even find a very uh, gory thing happening. Uh, his corpse was dug up, hung and beheaded uh, as soon as the restoration of monarchy happened. So in that sense, it is very difficult to figure out what kind of uh, image he had uh, in uh, England during that time. And also, um, we, the ironic thing that we begin to see is that 
even after the beheading of Charles I, even after the end of absolutist monarchy, there is a way in which Cromwell also assumes to power and begins to make the same kind of mistakes that Charles made. He also dissolves the parliament and he begins to assume the form of a dictator and makes decisions entirely on his own. In that sense, uh, at this point of time, the English people also fall into a kind of uncertainty and confusion about uh, their own discretions in uh, making decisions and uh, the parliament also is uh, quite ineffectual at this point of time. And looking at the Cromwellian uh, revolution, in fact, it is quite different from any of the other things that had happened in England until that point of time. Uh, the causes for this revolution, interestingly, were not social or economic. Uh, it, uh, um, there was no desire to recast society or redistribute wealth. Uh, it is also quite different from the Wars of the Roses, which we saw in the uh, early centuries. Uh, this was more like uh, this was never a struggle for power, this was never a struggle for property. So, the Cromwellian revolution during his period, it was more uh, dominated by the ideas of, uh, it was more uh, characterized by a war between the ideas of church and state. And in terms of the civil war and the Cromwellian revolution that followed, Trevelyan makes this interesting observation that town and country alike rushed to arms civil war came to every man's gate. So, it was a quite a different kind of uh, experience for the English people and this for the same reason shaped the English conscience and all, uh, all things English for many other centuries to come. And this was also fought for less selfish and also more idealistic kind of motives that also um, garnered certain kind of support for this uh, new movement that had come in. And this also did not have any kind of uh, uh, personal invested agenda. It is a different matter that later Cromwell rises to uh, an unconditional kind of power. But at the same time, this also had led to a lot of uh, revolution and religious and political thoughts in England. And also this was also perhaps the first time that the king and the parliament had come to loggerheads with each other. This also uh, gave this impression to the common people that they had more power than they had ever imagined. They were also able to exercise their support or uh, they were able to express their opinions with a lot of freedom. And in that sense we find the promise of uh, liberal humanism and the promise of secular spirit which began. Uh, with the Elizabethan period and English Renaissance, it comes to a certain kind of a fruition with this uh, after the Civil War. And this was also the uh, age of independence and individualism. Though in theory everything was promised to the English people from the beginning of the Renaissance, uh, with the Civil War and the end of the absolutist monarchy, the people begin to feel a sense of participation in the uh, in the matters of governance. They also begin to realize that the personal opinions do matter in the running of the state. And in terms of the other things, this was also the uh, high point of culture and we also find uh, widespread learning happening both classical and Christian. Perhaps it is uh, uh, just another irony that this period which was uh, quite turbulent internally, it also led to the emergence of uh, the age of uh, Milton which was one of the greatest uh, ages in literature. And we also find that though uh, Milton himself was a Puritan, we also find in him a fine spirit of uh, uh, literary excellence as well. So, many of the, those things we shall be taking a look at in the, one of the later sessions. And now it is time to quickly take a look at the period of interregnum from 1649 to 59 and uh, to see what had been happening in England after the civil war. So, the term interregnum is used to describe the uh, period between the civil war and the restoration of monarchy in 1660 with uh, Charles II and this period was dominated by the rule of Oliver Cromwell, the many details of which uh, we shall not be going into. And also in terms of literature, art and culture, this marks a transition between the Carolin and restoration period. So, whatever high point of uh, literary arts that had begun from the Elizabethan period onwards. Uh, this had uh, it had run its course and this was the time to tran transition towards another phase which we shall be taking a look at later with the beginning of the restoration period. And this period was uh, dominated by social and political uncertainty. Here we need to recall that when James first had come to power, many English people and the parliament 
they welcomed the, uh, this possibility with a lot of applaud and a lot of celebration because they thought that the period of political stability had uh, got inaugurated in England yet another time. And they also assumed that since James I was married and he also had kids which would ensure a proper kind of a succession, they had ruled out any other kind of problems which would come in uh, uh, by way of um, uh, the rule of monarchy. But we do find that the English history takes a very different turn of events and uh, uh, civil war and the events that followed were the least things that they had in mind when the 17th century had uh, inaugurated. And this nevertheless had a lot of positive influence later on because uh, the literature gets heavily influenced by these new uh, uh, political ideas which were uh, revolutionary, which were also uh, hitherto unseen. Now, having seen how the monarchy was laid to rest during the Caroline period, it is also important to now take a look at the other, uh, it is now important to take a look at the other way in which the age was uh, fashioned in terms of the age of uh, Milton. And uh, we shall be seeing at a later point that there, were, there are plenty of overlaps when we talk about Elizabethan, Jacobian and the Caroline period. And the age of Milton is no different and we also will find that some of the characters, some of the major literary figures, they appear over and again in the age of Milton as well. And there is a difficulty in classifying and grouping them into three, three different periods because of, um, because of the same reasons. Some historians only talk about a long English renaissance clubbing in the Elizabethan, Jacobian and the Caroline period together. But some historians have tried to bring about a distinction uh, um, among the three uh, groups, but uh, though they were politically very distinct, though the social religious tendencies were very different, though the state was getting fashioned and projected in three different ways, we find that the literature uh, in certain sense uh, continues in a seamless way and in, there are certain uh, literary figures which also show a marked departure from the previous one. And the age of Milton, though Milton continues to be the towering figure and he is uh, still considered as one of the greatest poets ever. In, uh, in, uh, if, if we do a general assessment of the age of Milton, many historians and critics are of the opinion that there is a decline from the high Elizabethan standards of the early 16, from the high Elizabethan standards of the 16th century. And uh, a couple of things that uh, uh, characterize, a couple of things that generally characterize this age are as follows. There was very less output of poetry. And again, uh, it is very difficult to come uh, reach these conclusions because the uh, Milton was also one of the greatest poets. And uh, with this period, we find the expansion of uh, prose. When, apart from the towering figure of Milton, we do not find many budding poets. We, we also uh, notice that prose is subjected to a lot of experiment. This is uh, in a certain way uh, 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 predominance of uh, prose in literature from this period onwards. And the most important and the dramatic thing that happens during this period is the closure of the theatre and also the end of uh, uh, and also the uh, collapse of uh, drama. So, we do not have many noted uh, dramatists to talk about. Theatre also uh, goes out of fashion for a while, but this also uh, leads to a major comeback with the restoration time, which is part of another lecture. So, with this socio-political uh, background and a brief introduction to literature, we begin to wind up today's lecture. And in, and in the next session, we shall be taking a detailed look at the literary output of the age of uh, Milton, including Milton and many of his contemporaries. We shall also be taking a detailed look at how the socio-political forces uh, shaped literature in particular ways. So, that is all we have got for today's lecture. We look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's session. Thank you for listening.